All right, good evening, everyone. Good evening. <clears throat> Welcome to our second week of our Daniel and Revelation seminar. How many of us have been enjoying the Daniel Re Revelation seminar each and every night? Amen. I hope that. Have you guys been learning something new every time? Amen. So we're going to start our nightly custom, and we're going to go into our quiz. We have three quiz questions. You guys ready for the quiz? So if you've answered and got the correct answer before, you are exempted from taking the quiz. And uh, we're going to ask three questions tonight, and whoever gets the question right will have a Bible bookmark uh, this evening. All right, you guys ready for question number one? All right, so here it is. Question number one. Number one, in Daniel chapter four, what diet did King Nebuchadnezzar eat when he became a beast? In Daniel chapter four, what diet did King Nebuchadnezzar eat when he became a beast? There is the microphone roaming, or I see a hand there. You can share your answer, and if you're right, Plant-based diet. Plant diet. All right, good job. You can come grab your bookmark. <clears throat> the answer for this question is King Nebuchadnezzar ate grass and plants during his time of humiliation. Then he praised and worshiped God. Here you go. Thank you so much. So what did he eat again, everyone? grass and plants. How, how many of us have ever tried grass before? Is, that, is, it, is it good? Masarap? With rice and sabaw? How about wheat grass? Have you tried wheat grass before? It doesn't taste that good, yeah? <laughs> but this is what the diet of King Nebuchadnezzar ate when he was a beast during his time of humiliation. That's Daniel chapter 4. All right, question number 2. Number 2, name two stories in the book of Daniel when a death decree was issued, or pad thai. Name two places. All you have to do is name Daniel chapter and then name the chapters. Name two stories in the book of Daniel when a death decree was issued. Anyone? Do you remember the death decrees that happened in the whole, from the whole book of Daniel? There are, two, there are actually three places in the whole book of Daniel, but I'm only asking for two places. All right, we have someone. Good job. You got it correct. All right. Here is the answers. You have it in Daniel 2, Daniel 3, and Daniel 6. In Daniel 2, you have the king's dream. You remember? The wise men couldn't give the dream. You can come grab your prize. The wise men couldn't come get the dream or the interpretation. And then Nick, King Nebuchadnezzar gives a death decree. And then in Daniel chapter 3, congratulations. Daniel chapter 3, King Nebuchadnezzar would throw anyone into the fiery furnace if they did not bow to the golden image. And then Daniel 6, King Darius made a death decree to destroy anyone who prayed and worshiped God. All right, good job in answering the questions. These are the basic, uh, the major death decrees that happen in the book of Daniel. All right, let's move on to our final question. Question number three says, what year did the papacy receive 
its deadly wound. What year did the papacy receive its deadly wound? Anyone? I'm sorry? 1798, correct. She got it correct. The papacy, you can come grab your prize. The papacy received its deadly wound in the year 1798 through General Berthier, that's the French general. There you go, congratulations. Through General Berthier, who took the Pope of Rome captive and brought him to exile, which led to his death in 1798. This is the year that Papal Rome, or the papacy, received its deadly wound. All right, thank you guys all for participating in our quiz questions. Um, before we move on, why don't we begin with a word of prayer, and then we'll go into our message this evening. Let us bow our heads. Father in heaven, we want to thank you so much, Lord, for this beautiful evening, for bringing us here together, Lord, to study and to open your word. Father, we want to ask, Father, for your presence to be with us this evening as we look into the book of Revelation now, as we're transitioning from Daniel to Revelation, we ask for your presence to be with us. We also ask, Father, for your Holy Spirit to be here. Help us, Lord, to uh, incline our ear to what the Spirit is speaking to us this evening. And Father, I pray, Lord, that you would tailor make this message to each and every individual here this evening as well. Father, may you please forgive us, Lord, of our sins. Hide me behind the cross and speak through me. May Jesus be lifted up tonight for we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're going to transition now into the book of Revelation. We already talked about the whole book of Daniel last week. And now we're going to start... Uh, our new lesson of the book of Revelation. And as we go through the Revelation, um, we're going to see lots of things taking place in Revelation. Now, Revelation, if you just study Daniel and Revelation, you're going to see that Daniel is a little bit more easier to understand. However, Revelation gets a little bit more deeper. And in order to understand Revelation, guess what book you need to understand first? Daniel, which everyone by God's grace, I hope we have somewhat of an understanding of Daniel. Now that you have an understanding of Daniel, now we can go into the book of Revelation. This is the last book of the Bible. So with that, are we all ready to study this evening? All right, the title for our message this evening is Introduction to Revelation and the Seven Churches. We're going to look at Revelation chapter 1 to 3. We're going to try to put all of these three chapters in, in one sermon by God's grace. And so we're going to look at the chapter 1 of Revelation, which is the introduction, and then the seven churches. All right. So now when you look at chapter 1, this is the basic breakdown of Revelation chapter 1. There are four items. What is the first item? The revealing of Jesus. It's going to reveal who Jesus is. The second thing that we have is the chain of we're going to look at how God speaks his messages to his people. There is a chain of command that goes through, comes from God, and it finally gets to us, his people. Then we're going to look at the threefold blessings of Revelation chapter 1. And then we're also going to look at the vision of Jesus. This is what John saw in Daniel, I mean Daniel, in Revelation chapter 1. All right, so this is basically the simple outline, and we're going to start off with the first one, the revealing of Jesus, which is Revelation 1, verses 1 through 8. If you have your Bibles, you can open them up with me. If not, I'll put the, the verses on the screen as well, so you can follow along. All right, how many of us have ever read the book of Revelation before? Okay, I see a couple of hands. When you read the book of Revelation... How many of us are just like this monkey? We're kind of curious, what does Revelation mean? Have you ever studied Revelation before and you're, or you read a verse or two about it and you realize, what in the world does this verse mean? What is all these beasts, these dragons, these uh, uh, heads, these lions, these bears? 
what is going on in Revelation? And what about the seven last plagues? And what about the seven uh, seals? What about the seven um, blessings of Revelation? If you all have been like me, I've been like this monkey before, where I've read something in Revelation and I have no clue what it understand, what, what to, you know, what to make of it, and I ha I can't even understand what it says. But a careful study of Revelation, when you have the Spirit of God and when you ask questions, will give us proper answers to understand the book of Revelation. When you ask more questions, the more answers you're going to get. And so this evening, what we're going to do is try to study the Bible so that we can understand from uh, a simple way to understand the book of Revelation. All right, let's go. Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. The Bible says, the revelation of Antichrist. What does the Bible say? You know, most people, when they read the book of Revelation, <clears throat> they automatically think, oh, Antichrist 666, Mark of the Beast. Many times when you, when you say the word revelation, all you could think of is just doom and gloom. Destruction, lake of fire, seven last plagues, I mean, you name it. But the very first book of this whole entire book of Revelation, the very first statement says, the revelation of who, everyone? Jesus Christ. Meaning to say that this book is going to reveal who Jesus is. Can you say amen? amen? It goes on to say, which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place, and he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John. The reason why revelation is so important is not only that it reveals Jesus Christ, but that it also shows us things which must shortly, what everyone, take place. That is prophecy. What is going to take place in the near future? What is going to take place uh, after this time, after the book of Revelation is written? And so we must understand that not only it reveals Jesus, but it shows us what to take place in the future. Why? So that we could prepare our hearts for future events, but specifically to prepare our hearts for the second coming of Jesus Christ. Can you say amen? So did you know that the word revelation in the Greek word, which is apocalypsis, this means to what everyone? Reveal or unveil. Meaning to say the book of Revelation reveals or unveils Jesus. Amen? We're going to see a picture of who Jesus is. And once you have a glimpse of Jesus, that should change your life so that you could be ready for Jesus to come. Can you say amen? amen? All right, so let's look at verses five through six. I'm skipping some verses just so that we could understand uh, the bigger context. Okay, notice what it says here. Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father and to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Can you say amen to this verse? This verse is showing, it's highlighting that the main person involved in the entire book of Revelation is none other than Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, ruler over the kings of the earth. He loved us. He washed us from our sins, from his own blood. Isn't this the good news? Isn't this the gospel? Brothers and sisters, this right here, this whole two verses, is the gospel in and of itself. The gospel is good news of Jesus Christ who came, who loved us with an everlasting love, who washed us from our sins. How? Through his own blood. That is the good news of Jesus. Can you say amen? amen? Now, not only that, notice what it says in the, in the next following verses. It says here, Behold, he is coming with clouds. What does that verse, what does that line really mean? It's referring to what event? 
the second coming of Jesus. And every eye, how many eye? Every eye will see him, even they who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. Then Jesus says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning. Alpha just simply means beginning, and the Omega just simply means end. Says the Lord, who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. This is a verse that is, is describing Jesus. So now, if you were to sum up the whole chapter 1, you're going to see multiple references pointing and alluding to Jesus Christ. Here are those references. Did you know in Revelation chapter 1, Jesus is mentioned as the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and end, the Almighty, the Son of Man, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the ruler of the... This is exactly what we just read in these verses. I just basically summarized it for you guys on the screen so that you could see that is all about Jesus. Amen? Now we're going to move on and look at the next part of our outline, which is the chain of command. Basically, what we're going to learn here is how does God communicate His messages or His revelations to His people? There is a chain of command. I want you to notice what Revelation chapter 1 verse 1 says. It says here, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which who, everyone? It starts up with God. God gave to who? Who is the him referring to? It's Jesus. God gives to Jesus a revelation of Jesus Christ. He gives to Jesus to show his who, everyone? His servants, things which must shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John. Notice the chain of command. Now, I want to read the verse 7 here because it also involves this next character. Notice what it says. Then I, John, was in the what, everyone? The Spirit. Does the Spirit, does the Holy Spirit, is the Holy Spirit involved in the chain of command? Yes. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet. Now, I want to show you a couple more verses. One more verse. It says here, in verse 11, what you see, write in a what, everyone? A book. And send it to the seven churches which are in Asia. And then it lists all the seven churches. Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Tyre, Sardis, Philip, uh, Phil, uh, Philippines, Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Almost tongue twisted there. All right, so notice the chain of command. God sends it to Jesus. Jesus sends it to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit then sends it to the prophet, the servant John. John sends it to the seven churches. And guess what God's people in the seven churches are to do? They are supposed to read the book, hear what it says, and then preach what it says to the whole entire world who does not know Jesus. Does that make sense, everyone? All right, we're going to look at one more thing. It says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the what, everyone? The churches. So if you want to know what the chain of command looks like, here it is. It starts off with God. God gave the message to Jesus. Then Jesus gave the message to who, everyone? the Holy Spirit, then the Holy Spirit gave the message to the angel. The angel gave the message to who? John. John wrote the message in a book and sent it to who, everyone? The seven churches. Then the churches were then supposed to share the contents with the world. Do you notice the chain of command here? Isn't this a beautiful command? The way that God communicates to His people, to the world, He goes through this whole entire chain. All of these chains are involved in reaching out to the world that is in darkness and in sin. Now, can you say amen to that? Because part of this world, you can put a parenthesis right here. You can put your name right there. Amen? Meaning to say, how does God speak to you? God speaks through His Son, Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, through an angel, through the prophet, through the church, 
And then the church preaches the gospel to the audience. Can you say amen? Amen. This is how God works. All right, now we're going to look at the threefold blessings of Revelation. Notice Revelation chapter 3, verse 1. It says, Blessed is he who, what everyone? Reads, and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it for the, the time is near. What time is near is referring to the second coming of Jesus. Meaning to say, if you want to be prepared for the second coming of Jesus, guess what three things that we need to do? Read, hear, and keep the things that are written in this prophecy. Does that make sense, everyone? We need to read, we need to hear, and we need to keep. Out of these three, which of the three is the most hardest to do? I heard hear. Right now, you are hearing a message about revelation. Is that easy to do? I hope it is. <laughs> is it easy to read revelation? You can read revelation. You can hear revelation. But how about keep? Whatever the book of revelation says, is it easy for us to keep what it says inside? Sometimes not all the time. And we need to have God's spirit in order to keep the things that are written in this book. Can you say amen? Amen. So these are the threefold blessings of Revelation. This should make us want to study the book of Revelation. Amen? All right. Now we're going to move on to the, the, next, the next part of our uh, outline, which is the vision of Jesus in Revelation chapter 1, verse 9 through 20. All right. In Revelation 1, verse 9, it says, I, John, both your brother and companion in tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ was on where, everyone? An island, the island that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony. What was the name of the island that John was on? Patmos. Patmos. Just, a, just a word of history. Have you guys ever heard of Alcatraz Island? Alcatraz Island is located in San Francisco in the cold waters off the coast of San Francisco. And this island is basically uh, in the middle of the sea and you have cold waters surrounding it. Basically what Patmos was, it was an isolated island. And it was meant for people to be exiled on the island. Those who were found guilty of breaking the laws of Rome were sent to this island in Patmos just so that they could die off. Now on this island, there's basically no life. And you just stay on the island until you die. And John was on this island called Patmos for what reason, it says? For the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. He was here on this island because he stood for the word of God and he had the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, this is very important. I want to read to you a quote. This is Acts of the Apostles, page 570. Notice what inspiration says. John was cast into a what, everyone? Cauldron of boiling oil. But the Lord preserved the life of his faithful servant, even as he preserved the who, everyone? Who is the three Hebrews talking about here? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, where? What chapter was the fiery furnace in Daniel? Chapter 3. Three. Here we go. 3. It was in chapter 3 that God had preserved the life of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And just like how he preserved their life, God preserved John's life while he was in the cauldron of boiling oil. In the history, it tells us that they tried to burn him up. But because he would not die, they sent him to Alcatraz Island or Patmos so that he could be alone and die on that island without food or without any necessities of life. All right. So now notice the next verse. I was in the spirit on what day, everyone? What is the Lord's day referring to? It's the Sabbath. 
I don't have the time to go into it, but the Lord's Day is the Sabbath. You can look at Isaiah chapter 53 as well if you want for further reference. So he was on the Sabbath day, and I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega. Who is the Alpha and Omega? The first and the last. And what you see, what everyone? Write in a book and send it to who everyone? The seven churches. And it lists the, the seven churches. So what day did John basically see Jesus? It was on Sabbath. Here's a powerful lesson. If you want to see Jesus, perhaps not physically, but if you want to experience Jesus, what day is the best day to experience Jesus? It's the Sabbath day. Amen? If you want to experience Jesus like how John did, the best day was on the Sabbath day. And, and, and on this day, he had a vision of Jesus. Now, what did John see? What did John see? We're going to look at the next verse. This is what John saw, verse 12. Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and having turned, I saw what, everyone? Seven golden lampstands. So this is what John saw. He saw seven golden lampstands, and notice the next verse. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one, notice how it's capitalized, one, like the Son of Man, who is the Son of Man, everyone? That's Jesus clothed with a garment down to the feet and girded about the chest with a golden band. Who did John see while he was in vision on Sabbath? He saw Jesus. And not just Jesus, but he saw the seven lampstands. Amen? He sees Jesus and the seven lampstands. Okay, now what else did he see? Verse 14 through 16. His head and hair were like white like wool, as white as snow. We don't have the time to go into that, but white just simply means purity of character. White is symbolic of the purity of God's character, and this is what John saw, white head and white hair. White head? He saw a head and hair were white like as wool and white as snow. Now notice the eyes. And his eyes like a flame of what, everyone? Do you know what fire represents in the Bible? For God is a consuming, it's His presence. God, it's His presence. His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace, and His voice as the sound of how many waters? Many waters. He had in his right hand, what everyone? Seven stars out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. So now, in the next verse says, And when I saw him, that's Jesus, I fell at his feet as what everyone? Pad Thai. I fall at his feet as dead, but... He laid his right hand on me, saying, Do not be what, everyone? Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive for how long, everyone? Forevermore. Is that good news? Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. Meaning to say, God has the keys, has conquered death and hell for us. Why? Did Jesus live a perfect life? Yes. Did Jesus die on the cross? Yes. Did Jesus resurrect? Yes. What would happen if Jesus lived a perfect life, he died on the cross, but he never did res resurrect from the grave? What would happen? Jesus would not be our Savior. That means Jesus wouldn't have the keys of Hades and death, meaning Jesus would never conquer the grave and hell. Does that make sense, everyone? This shows us the fact that he is alive every more, the fact that he is resurrected from the grave, shows us that he 
has the victory over Hades and death. Can you say amen? If you want the victory over the grave and death, guess who we need to know? It's Jesus. If we know Jesus, we can survive death and we can survive the grave. Amen? <clears throat> then, it, then it says, Write the things which you have seen and the things which are and the things which will take place after this. All right, so now here's the summary. John basically sees Jesus dressed as a what, everyone? A high priest walking amongst the seven candlesticks, holding the seven stars, ministering in the sanctuary as a resurrected person. Isn't this beautiful? John basically goes into, the, into vision. He's on the island of Patmos. He looks up and he sees Jesus and the seven, uh, the seven candlesticks, and Jesus is holding in his hand, what is this, everyone? The seven stars. Now, we need to ask an important question. What do the stars represent, and what do the seven candle, candlesticks represent? What do the stars, and what do the seven candlesticks represent? What does it represent? Let's go to the next verse. Here's what the next verse says. In verse 20 to 21, it says, The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are what, everyone? Angels. What are the seven stars? Angels. An angel is basically a messenger <clears throat> of the seven churches. And the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. Question. What do the seven lampstands represent? Seven churches. What do the seven stars represent? Angels. What are the threefold blessings of Revelation? Hear, read, and keeps. Which one of the three is the hardest to do? Keeps. All right, you guys are tracking. Good job, everyone. All right, we're moving on. I want to read to you a quote in Acts of the Apostles. This is Ellen White in page 586. Notice what she says. These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand. These words are spoken to who, everyone? The teachers in the church. Do you know any teacher in the church? Do you guys have teachers here at AUP? Are there any teachers here tonight at AUP? I see one or two. Did you know that the seven stars in his right hand represent the teachers? The teachers in the church, those entrusted by God with weighty responsibility. Did you know that if you are a teacher of the Word of God, a teacher of the church, you have been entrusted by God with weighty responsibilities? Can you say amen? Now with that in mind, how many of us want to be a teacher? No one? Okay, I saw one hand. Notice what she says. The sweet influences that are to be abundant in the church are bound up with God's who, everyone? Minister. So it's not just the teachers, but it's the ministers, she says. Those are the stars. Who are to reveal the what, everyone? The love of Christ. Okay, going back. Who are the seven stars represent in the right hand? teachers in the church and God's ministers who are to reveal the love of Christ. The stars of heaven are under his control. He fills them with light. He guides and directs their movements. Now, she continues. If God did not do this, they would become what stars? Fallen stars. What is a falling star? It's kind of like Lucifer. He was a star that fell from heaven. So with his what, everyone? His ministers, they are but instruments in his hands, and all the good they accomplish is done through... What do the stars represent, everyone? Angels, which is messengers, and according to inspiration, also represents teachers and ministers. 
Why? Because they have a deep and weighty responsibility to reflect the love of Jesus to the world. Does that make sense, everyone? All right. Now we're going to look at the seven churches, the seven churches of Revelation chapter 2. Here is basically a map. If you look at this map, you see the map here? What does it kind of look like? in terms of sanctuary uh, artifacts. It kind of looks like a seven branch candlestick, doesn't it? You guys see this? It's a seven branch candlestick. That's very, that's very important. Okay, now we're gonna look at the seven churches. Here are the seven churches uh, on the screen. The first church is Church of Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamus, Thyatira, Sardis, not Philippines, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Now, something interesting about these seven churches, I want to read to you a quote from Acts of the Apostles. Notice what she says. The names of the seven churches are what, everyone? Symbolic of the church in different periods of the Christian era. The number seven indicates completeness and is symbolic of the fact that the messages extend to who, where everyone the end of time meaning to say the messages contained in the seven churches is for an end time people it's for an end time prophecy or an end time message for god's people in the last days while the symbols used reveal the condition of the church at different periods in the history of the world basically if you look at the seven churches, you're going to see that it is God's church. Whose church, everyone? It is God's church that start off in the year 31 AD. What happened in 31 AD, everyone? Jesus was crucified. He died in 31 AD, and he also resurrected in 31 AD. Does that make sense, everyone? Does does having a knowledge of Daniel help us to understand about these dates? Yes. So in 31 AD, Jesus was crucified and then he resurrected from the grave. Before Jesus left the earth, before Jesus resurrected, he had a meeting with his 12 disciples. You guys remember this scene? And what did he promise the 12 disciples that they will have once he leaves? The Holy Spirit. And a few days went by, and what came on the day of Pentecost? The outpouring of the early rain or the Holy Spirit. This was the first church of Ephesus. This was the apostolic church or the church of the apostles, the 12 apostles. This started the first church of Jesus, where you had Peter, you had Thomas, you had all the 12 disciples basically in this first church. And from this first church, it goes all the way down the time, timeline of history till you get to the church of Laodicea. And what year did the church of Laodicea begin to, to start? In 1844. Question, what church are we living in today? The church of Laodicea. Does that make sense, everyone? Okay. Now, if you look at the names of the churches, they all have different definitions of what it is. The church of Ephesus simply means desirable. Why was it desirable? Because it was God's first church. It was desirable because God's people during that time, if you remember history, what happened when the, when the Holy Spirit came down on the first church in Acts? How many people came into the church? thousands that's why it's considered as the church that is desirable because thousands came into the church as a result of preaching jesus has crucified and jesus has resurrected for each and every one they turn the world upside down does that make sense everyone okay so now when you go down to smyrna you'll see that it's called bittersweet myrrh the reason why it's bittersweet myrrh is because there was a lot of persecution going on during this time. 
When you look at the church of Pergamos, Pergamos just simply means elevation. Thyatira means sacrifice of penitence. Sardis means escaping. Now, interesting to note, when you look at the church of Thyatira, what year did Thyatira begin to start? In the year 538. What happened in 538, according to our Daniel class? What happened in 538? In 538, it was the start of the little horn rule. From 538 all the way to 1798. Does that make sense, everyone? Starting in 538, this is the time of Papal Rome rule. During this time of Papal Rome rule, Thyatira was God's church during that time. And if, you're gonna, if you look at the meaning of Thyatira, it means sacrifice of penitence. God's people were being sacrificed in this church. Nearly 50 million people had died during this time. Now we're going to look at the church of Sardis, the fifth church, which means escaping. In the 1500s, you're going to see that God's church escaped from the hand of persecution. Who are the people that escaped from the hand of Roman papal persecution? If you look at the book Great Controversy, you're going to see a list of people who were reformers who are Protestant reformers, such as Calvin, Martin Luther, Zwingli, Huss, Jerome. Are these ringing a bell, everyone? These were the people who escaped, who escaped from Rome. Even though they died, they were carrying the torch, the light of truth, all the way through the Dark Ages. Then you come to the Sixth Church, Church of Philadelphia, which means brotherly love. In 1740 to 1844, this was the time that God's church was getting ready to preach the three angels' message. During this time, you have this movement called the Millerite movement. This is where William Miller, during the 1800s, begins to study Daniel and Revelation. He begins to realize that Jesus is coming back soon. And during this time period, during this church of Philadelphia, William, William Miller, along with other people, have been preaching the gospel that Jesus is about to come soon. Then you have the church of Laodicea, 1844. What happened in 1844, everyone, according to our Daniel class? The investigative judgment starts in heaven, right? The books are open. And then you have, in 1844, here on earth, you have an event called the Great Disappointment. And since 1844, the church of Laodicea has been recovering from the Great Disappointment. Can you say amen? This is the church that we are currently living in because at the end of this church, guess who comes? Jesus. The second coming of Jesus. Now, when you look at each church, each church has a meaning of their name, different characteristics. They receive a commendation. They are reproved, they, like they are rebuked, and they receive counsel and a promise. When you look at each church, you're going to see that each church kind of has a pattern. A what, everyone? A pattern of how God tries to reach that church. You're going to look... Not all of the church, but most of the seven churches has issues. How many of us have issues? <laughs> Don't raise your hand. We all have issues here in this room, right? Do we all struggle with sin? The Bible says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to flash very quickly. We're almost done here. Every single church, and we're going to look at their issue. But then we're also going to look at how God tries to counsel them through that issue. We're going to learn some practical lessons here. You guys ready to study? All right, let's start off with the first church, the church of Ephesus. It means desirable. And then the, common, the commendation, these, these are the good things that happen to the church. Jesus says in Revelation 2, verse 1 to 3, I know your works and your what everyone your patience. This church is a hard-working church. It's masipag. And it's also patient. Is that, good thing, is that good characteristics to have in a church? Yes. 
But notice what Jesus says is the reproof. Thou has left your first love. What does the first love really mean? What, is, what does that mean to us? You, is, you have lost sight of Jesus. They have left their first love. And then it says, uh, it mentions the group name Nicolaitans. Uh, we don't have the time to go into the very details of it. But basically, they had left Jesus. So now this church, the church of Ephesus, this is the apostolic church. This is the 12 disciples. Remember, thousands are coming into the church. But then all of a sudden, they lose sight of Jesus, and then the work kind of stops. It kinda, it's going downhill, and people are not coming into the church. Then Jesus comes to this church and says to them, He who hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says. Basically, this is what it says. I didn't put it on here, so I'll, I'll just explain really quickly. The counsel to this church was to basically repent. To what, everyone? Repent. To go back where you had sin, to stop sinning and repent. Basically, it just means come back to me. Come back to Jesus. Let's make this practical. How many of us have left their first love, Jesus. If you left Jesus, the counsel to this church, the counsel to us, is to come back to Jesus and repent. Amen? Come back to Jesus and repent. And, we, and when, you, when you see what happens, God gives them a promise to overcome if you accept Jesus as, the savior, as your Savior. Can you say amen? So basically, this church, Ephesus, was known for the seat of Diana. Basically, Diana was a goddess. Uh, it was a big, a big thing back then. And it was a great goddess in the Roman and Hellenistic religion. And something important was that Paul spent three years there. And he, he began to reach the people there. Um, and there's just so much details going on into the church. I just only want us to understand the main things. The main thing about this first church is that if you left Jesus, please come back to Jesus. Amen? Second church, Smyrna. Smyrna means sweet smelling. Something good about this church is that they are, they are poor, but in actuality, they are rich. Now, the reproof in this church, there's, it's interesting, there's no reproof in this church, in the church of Smyrna. You can look it up. But the counsel of this, because they were being persecuted, the counsel, we read this the other day, was to be faithful, and I will give you a crown of life. When you are faithful in the little things, you will receive a crown, and that was the promise to this church. Let's make this practical. If you are suffering persecution, brothers and sisters, I want you to know, continue being faithful. And God promised a crown of life. Can you say amen? Third church, Pergamus. The meaning basically means elevation. It was a compromising church. This church basically compromised God's word, God's truth, God's law with the things of this world. And the good thing about this church was that you hold fast to my name and you do not deny my faith. So in other words, they were, uh, they were Christians only in name. But the reproof was that some still hold on to the doctrines of Balaam and Nicolaitans. Basically, the doctrine of Balaam and Nicolaitans is basically those that do not keep the law of God, those who do not uh, practice the word of God. It's called antinomianism, which means no law. They disregard the law of God. But the counsel to them was to what, everyone? Repent. And he who overcomes receives a new name. Let's make this practical. If you are struggling with keeping God's law, or God's Ten Commandments, God says, come back to me and 
repent. Amen? And if you repent, he who overcomes, you will receive a new name, a new character, the character of Jesus. Fourth church, Thyatira, we're almost done, we're halfway through. It says here, the meaning is sweet savor of labor, sacrifice of contrition, the corrupt church. These, this church was corrupted with the influences of pagan Rome, of papal Rome as well. And Jesus says, I know your works and your love. You're doing good works in this church. You're witnessing. But here's the reproof. You allow Jezebel to seduce my servants. This is an act of compromising, taking the truth and compromising it with the things of this world. And the counsel here is to repent and hold fast. And if you overcome, God will give you power over the nations. Is that good news? Let's make this practical. If you are struggling with compromise, one hand the things of this world and the other hand the things of God, Jesus says, come back to me, repent, and hold fast to what you have. Can you say amen? When we do this, you will have the victory to overcome all nations. Amen? Fifth church, Sardis. Not sardines. Sardis. The meaning of Sardis is renewal, that which remains, or reformation. The dead church. Basically, this was a dead church. The commendation is that you are alive. At least you're not dead. You're alive. But the reproof, your works are not perfect before God. This church was, suffer was suffering with salvation through works. They believe in the things that they do could save them. They got kind of too conservative, and they said that, you know, if we do this, do, do, do this, not do, do, but do, do this, then we will be saved. The reproof, your works are not perfect before God. The counsel, be watchful, strengthen your brethren, and what everyone? Repent. repent. Time after time again, each church has a condition that they are facing with, and God just simply says, repent, repent, repent. Come back to me, come back to me, and I love you just the way you are. Is that good news? He who overcomes shall be clothed in white raiment. You will have the righteousness of Jesus. Sixth church, Philadelphia. The meaning is brotherly love. This church was a good church. It was faithful. They have kept my words. And what is the reproof? None. But the counsel is just simply hold fast to what you have. Hold fast to what you have. And those who per persevere, them will I keep. This is a good church. Now let's look to the last church. The last church, Church of Laodicea, just simply means nation of judgment. It means judgment. The lukewarm church. The commendation is what, everyone? What did they do good? There is nothing really good about this church. This is the church that we're living in today. Here's the reproof. I will spill you out of my mouth. In other words, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say that you are rich, but you're actually poor. You say that you are this, but you're actually not that. You're claiming to be a Christian, but you're actually not a Christian in name. Notice the counsel. Buy from me what everyone? Gold tried in the fire. The gold that's tried in the fire represents God's faith. We need to have the faith of Jesus, the righteousness of Jesus. The eye cell basically is the Holy Spirit for discernment to know what is the truth. And then it says, the promise, he who overcomes, he will sit with me on my throne. Let's make this practical. Perhaps you realize that nothing is wrong with you. Perhaps you realize that you're good. I'm okay. I can handle myself. The counsel 
come back to me. Behold, I stand at the door and what, everyone? And knock. If any man hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him or sup with him. Jesus wants to come in to our hearts. If we just let him come into our hearts, he will abide in us. Can you say amen? By the way, this church, if you remember in Revelation chapter 3, it says that Jesus is knocking at the door. What does that mean in, in referring to his location? If, is he in the church or is he outside of the church? He's outside. He's outside trying to come in. Will you let him in today? I want to read this last quote before we close. It says here, last day events, page 186. Before the final visitations of God's judgments, that's the time of trouble, it's the seven last plagues, upon the earth, there will be among the people of the Lord such a what, everyone? Revival of primitive godliness as has not been witnessed since when, everyone? Apostolic times. When was the apostolic times happened? It started with the apostolic church. What church was the apostolic church? The church of Ephesus, correct. What happened in the church of Ephesus? How many people were converted on a day-to-day -day basis? Thousands. Did you know, brothers and sisters, Ellen White tells us, like, there's so much in, in Spirit of Prophecy. She says that if we come back to how the first church was living, a church of evangelism, a church of total membership involvement, if we came back to that spirit of that first church, the whole world would be turned upside down. And at this moment, the world is not turned upside down. We are kind of lacking on that point, which means to say that the church of Laodicea is a sleeping or you could say dead church, and it needs to wake up. When we wake up, we're going to be preaching the three angels' message and that fourth angel in Revelation 18 to warn the world that Jesus is coming soon. Are we doing that as a church? She goes on to say, Lord, uh, <clears throat> such a revival of primitive godliness as has not been witnessed since when, everyone? Apostolic times, the Spirit and the power of God will be poured out upon his children. How many of us want the Spirit of God to be poured out upon us this evening? If that is your desire, ask that you please stand with me as we close in prayer. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we're so thankful, Lord, for this opportunity to study very briefly about the seven churches and Revelation chapter 1. Father in heaven, thank you, Lord, for reminding us that the book of Revelation is not about beasts and dragons and mark of the beast and antichrist, Father, but it's about Jesus Christ. Father, help us to realize that you are coming soon. And Father, perhaps we are struggling with a certain kind of condition that the seven churches have been facing. Oh, Father in heaven, if that is us tonight. I pray, Lord, that your spirit would convict us of sin so that we would come back to Jesus, repent of our sins, and be right in your image to preach your word. Father in heaven, I pray, Lord, that you would wake us up, wake this church up spiritually so that we can turn the world upside down as your apostles did in the church of Ephesus. This is our humble prayer, for we ask this in Jesus' name. Let everyone say, Amen. Amen.